If you love this podcast, you're going to love Fine Gardening's All Access. You'll gain complete entry to our website and become a part of our community with exclusive gardening insight and advice for your region. Go to finegardening.com to sign up for a free 14-day trial. Welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who just love plants. Just not always the same ones. I'm Steve Aiken, the editor-at-large of Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the executive editor of Fine Gardening Magazine. And guess what, Steve? It's your favorite episode of the year. (laughs) It's the holiday wish list episode. And I bet you thought, because it's a pandemic and we're taping remotely, that I would forget the jingle bells. But I didn't! Yeah, no, I, I, I had honestly forgotten about the jingle bells. <laughs> Are you pleasantly surprised? And so, what we're doing the wish list today... <laughs> Yes, we are doing holiday wish list. And for those of you who haven't heard our prior holiday wish list episodes, these are not necessarily brand new plants. They could be. These are not necessarily the most flashy plants on the planet, but they're plants that I basically, my list is man, I should be growing that. I am, if if Santa Claus or, you know, whoever non-denominational gift giver that you believe in was going to deliver something on my doorstep as far as plants is concerned, these are the four that I would want him to drop down the chimney doorstep, I don't know, through the window. (laughs) Okay, can can, can I I just say that my plants come with an asterisk um, (laughs) because I think I might have mentioned all four of these on like last year's or the year before's wish list. Cause I, I, I have been thinking for so long, like I really want these plants. And then I also have to say, and you're going to get mad at me for this, but like, I don't even know the names of a couple of them. I couldn't figure out what the, what the name is. I'll give you, I'll give you a good bet to go on, but like what the actual true name is, is, is. Wait, what do you mean? In like the, the actual like botanical Latin name? I like the cultivar names. It's like, well, it's oh, this or it's that or it's this other thing or it could be this third thing. And it's just like, oh, wow. can we all, you know, we just want us all to get together, you know, as as a, as as a team, like a gardening team. Okay, everyone, huddle in. <laughs> we're we're going to call it this. Okay, it doesn't matter what it was called back then. We're going to call it this from now on. Okay, everybody, good. Okay, break, and then we go and. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm okay with whatever you say. Whatever you're going with, let's just go with it. Because honestly, they're going to change it tomorrow. They'll make it salvia something tomorrow. You know. Well, it's 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 not even the Latin names. It's the cultivar names. So like somebody's selling it under something. So you know your favorite uh, Spirea ogon. Oh yeah. You know, is sold under the name Mellow Yellow. Yeah, sure is. And then and 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 sometimes sometimes it's in cultivar. Uh, quotes sometimes it's trademark sometimes it's not yeah you know and it's just like no it's ogon it's ogon it's ogon just stop stop with the mellow yellow it, um, yeah it really has and aren't aren't certain who the he, they who shall not be named plant companies haven't they gotten in trouble before where they then do genetic testing on the I'm not going to say mellow yellow, but I, for an example, on mellow yellow and ogon turns out to be the exact same plant, but they're trying to say that it's a different plant. Uh, I, I think I think most people agree that it's it's the same plant. Hmm. It's just you know they're calling it a different thing. Hmm. You know? hmm. Just to make our lives difficult, right? <laughs> well, I, 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 that I guess I guess people don't want to grow like mellow yellow is friendlier than ogon who's like who's like a um a villain from you know the avengers movie or something like that you no, know I just must feel defeat like ogon no i just feel like it's like a norse god of this of the great you know viking era that sort of thing yeah like o- odin's odin's younger brother yeah ogon. ogon you know he was he wasn't as cool he got into trouble he wasn't his parents this, this, this guy, like, here he comes ogon oh god oh, just god. avert your glance it's ogon again <laughs> All right, so this might actually be the longest intro ever, but you know, (laughs) 
I do want to know what plant you're talking about. Am I going to force your hand if I ask you to talk about the one that you're, the plant that you're saying has a weirdo name? Um, it, it doesn't have a weirdo name. It's just, it just has confusing three. Well, a couple of them have different, different names. Um, in fact, three out of the four have names that it, well, it could be this or it could be that. Um, but what, you know, why don't I start with the one whose name I am certain of? <laughs> All right. Okay. Why don't you start and in then, the exact and then, and then, opposite and, direction as and, I think? And then, and then. Yeah. And then, you know, when, when the names are, are, are off, like you just Google the other one and then they all come up when you Google them, but yeah. I don't want people to be confused to say it's a different plant. It's probably the same plant. All right. Um, but one plant that I always want to grow and every time I see it, I'd say, why am I not growing it? And I actually wrote it down this year. Like I have a little list. I'm starting a little list of things I definitely want to grow next year. Mm -hmm. And second on the list was autumn minaret daylily. Mm, yes. So uh, anybody who knows, it's a daylily. Okay. I, I think we, we all know daylilies with the strappy green foliage and those, I don't know, like uh, sort of exploding trumpet like uh, flowers. Um, but just imagine that instead of blooming in summer, it blooms in late summer, like August, September type thing. And then imagine it was six to seven feet tall. And then you've got autumn minaret. I mean, this thing is, it's, it's giant. I mean, you, you know, it's like, it's, it, it's, it's like it's on stilts or something because it has these really long scapes and going up to, um, uh, you know, the, the daylily flower, which is bigger, you know, mm -hmm. um, not huge, but it's bigger than the, than the normal ones, you know, given, given its stature. Um, they're like, they're like in, a, in like a gold, orangey yellow type vibe. I always get like an orangey yellow vibe from them. And then if you're tall enough to see inside, you know, there's like there's like a maroon or rust colored you know throat or eye zone halo i saw you know five different you know terminology for this but on the inside there's there's a little bit of a uh, of coloration too um and it's ju it's just so amazing at a time when you know fall bloomers are just starting to come out and the summer bloomers are just it's like a black eyed susan type season mm -hmm. um kind of thing but uh you know i just I, i'm always impressed with it i always want to grow it and is there a plant that's easier to grow than a daylily? You know, it it, it is to, it, you were supposed to answer like, no, Steve, there's not. Wait, 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 my internet cut out. I couldn't answer. I couldn't answer. No, no, there is nothing easier to grow than a daylily. So what I was going to say was daylilies are to sun what hostas are to shade. Oh. Like that's super easy to grow plant. Um that you can, you can kind of put in almost anywhere and they look cool and they come in a gazillion different varieties. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are forgettable or interchangeable. Um, don't shoot me for, for saying that hosta and daylily experts, <laughs> um, but it's true. Um, I can't tell the difference between most of them, uh, but the ones that stand out are magnificent, like autumn minaret. Um, so like I said, about six to seven feet tall, probably about two feet wide, full sun, um, probably it's not that not too fussy about soil. Mm -mm. Um, I find daylilies to be difficult to kill, uh, honestly. Um, so if you get if you get them established and going, then they're, then they're going great. But um, by by this time next year, I want to tell you how great my autumn minaret daylily is growing in my garden, and not to have it on the wish list for for twenty twenty one. Right, because we're going to get all sorts of nasty letters if we go four years and it's still on your list. But I mean, I feel like daylilies don't don't get a fair shake anymore you know i feel like i we started the, we, we did we did a whole we did a whole episode on that i mean we did but i feel like they've fallen into the category of i've talked about this about ogon spirea to bring it back to the to the top of the show we feel like they're overdone because they're so tough they're so tough i mean that's the reason that they're in every grocery store circle in the middle of the parking lot because they get hit by snow plows covered in salt you know half peed on by a dog and they still live so and and, and just because stella doro sucks yeah doesn't mean we should we should stop growing daily well which honestly i don't feel like stella doro sucks it's just over you oh it's just Right, right. It's just over it's, here. It's a, it's a perfectly fine plant. And uh, I'm actually dealing with this with annuals. And we, you know, I'm writing an article on annuals. And the problem isn't that annuals suck. It's the way people use them. Yeah. So the whole article, which everyone will have a, a wonderful uh, time to look forward to, it's about how to use them properly. Yeah. So, so yeah. To tune into our March and April issue 
issue 198, yeah. how to use annuals properly. But yeah, in my book, you know what? If a dog can pee in a plant and it still lives, it's a winner. <laughs> I guess that's one test. And by the way, don't don't go nursery shopping with Danielle because, you know. <laughs> It's my, it's my tester. It's my tester. Good here, here, here's Sparky. <laughs> Try this one. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. So I don't think I have any repeats on my list of wish list plants. And that doesn't mean because I didn't get, I got everything off my list from last year because I don't think I did. I might have gotten one of the plants off of there, but um, I, I feel like my list is never ending of plants. You know, I, I go through a photo shoot that I did last year and, and think, oh, I need that plant or, you know, the, the latest, you know, PR release from wherever it comes in for new plants. And I'm like, oh, look at that. That's so exciting. Um, so I'm going to start off with a tree that I've seen in several botanic gardens over the years. Um, and i I'm in love with this tree. I don't know why I'm not growing it. Um, it's a pine. So that might be why. It's actually a lace bark pine. So it's Pinus um, bungiana, which is zones four to eight. It's pretty cool for a pine tree. It has a multi stem trunk to it. Very large kind of muscular multi armed trunk. And the bark on this tree looks similar to a sycamore. It peels into olive, silver, tan. It looks camouflage. It's so, so cool. And just because of the way that it holds, it's almost like candelabra branches. You really do get to see the exfoliating bark, which I feel like with a lot of trees, we say, oh, and the bark's exfoliating. And it's like, great. I'm never going to see it because, you know, the branches come all the way to the ground. But this guy is pretty intense. Um, I've seen it in Colorado. I've seen it out in the Midwest. I saw it, I believe, at the Morton Arboretum. It's cool. Um, has longer needles, dark green pine needles that are about four inches long. It gets yellow pine cones, um, these seeded kind of yellow cones to it, which is really striking because they're bright, bright yellow, which is interesting. Um, and it's a slow growing conifer. So it's not a dwarf conifer. It's still over the course of, they say, 50 years can get up to 30 to 40 feet tall and about half as wide, but it's super slow growing. So it's not going to be something, you know, a pine, like a white pine, pine astrobus that eats your house. Um, I just, I really dig it. And you know, I have primarily a woody plant based landscape. Trees and shrubs are my deal. And I'm planning on. I can't believe I'm saying this, but extending out my garden uh, next year, kind of in my back 40 area. And I just feel like this could be the focal point tree that I put in that area because it's sun, part shade, and really well-drained soil, which is is kind of right up the alley of this lace bark pine. Um, so lace bark pine, zones four to eight. Um, I, I don't know what more you could want, you know, evergreen, cool bark, interesting growth habit, focal point. It's a winner and it's never made it into my shopping basket. So maybe this year it will. Yeah. You know, the, uh, I, I felt the same way about that plant and like seeing it and wondering why I'm not growing it. My concern is that by the time, you know, it, it matures up and you get to see that, that cool bark, uh, I'm going to be dead. Um, well, I'm younger than so, you, so I've got a, I've got a right, fighting right. chance. So you still, you still have time. <laughs> um, but if, if camouflage, you know, if the military, um, it, when they developed camouflage, consulted a fashion designer, that's what the 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 uh, the, the bark would look like. Yeah, you know, it's like a stylish camouflage. It's it's extremely striking. And the thing I like about it is that for for a lot of trees, all you see is the trunk. Mm -hmm. Like after a while, that's all you get. Yeah, when it lives is up, the trunk. Yeah. And this one has a gorgeous, gorgeous trunk. So, um, yeah, great, great plant. Um, it's really yeah. cool. It's really cool. And I, I guess I, I didn't realize that the those little yellow cones, you know, would be so striking. But it, they really, really are. We'll put a picture up on the on online. If you go to our website, you'll see the picture. You got you got a cone thing. I do. Cone. 
fetish or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That doesn't sound good at all. Okay. So the, well, like, I don't know the backstory yeah. on this listeners, if we haven't told this story a million times, which I feel like we have is my first photo trip with Steve 14 years ago for fine gardening, we were driving along and we, we, I started screaming as the driver, Oh my God, upright purple cones, upright purple cones. And Steve thought that he was going to die and was like, you know, bracing himself against the car because he thought I was going to drive off the road to go and see the upright purple pine cones on this particular, I think it was a Norway spruce. (laughs) But you're Uh, yeah, well, what has upright purple cones? I don't think it's a Norway spruce. Is it it's not a, 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 oh, it's Abies. Abies. I don't know. Yes, I think it's uh, Abies Picea. Is is that yeah, something like that? We can look it up later. It's one of those weird ones with two genuses as its name. All right. So, what do you have that you also had on your list apparently last year that you're going to talk about again this year? <laughs> Do you need the jingle bells again? Hold on. <laughs> I get you in the mood. <laughs> so since we're on a pine kick, um, I will I will go with the pine that's on my list. And I think last time I had, um, I think I had Chief Joseph Lodgepole Pine on my list. You did. Uh, yeah. Yes, because we had an Instagram uh, follower. Follow the Let's Argue About Plants Instagram page, by the way, listeners. But we had a listener who tagged us because she was inspired by your Chief Lodgepole pine, right? Yeah, and, and I, I still don't grow it, and she does, so good for her. <laughs> but uh, my, my new love, uh, the, the new plant that I've fallen in love with is, uh, is a Karsten's Winter Gold Mugo Pine. Um, I always like Mugo Pines. You, you, you see them, they, they, for some reason, they have like a 70s vibe to me. <laughs> Um, I don't know why they, they were, they were, they remind me of things that were, you know, I don't know. Uh, but this is Pinus Mugo, Karsten's winter gold zones two to seven. Um, so, so cold. Yes. Uh, heat, Mm -hmm. not so much. Um, it only gets to be about two or three feet wide. Um, and we did a whole show on dwarf conifers and why they're great and why we all need more of them. So I won't go into that. Um, but this is, you know, a Mugo pine, um, to, to me has like, it has like longer, um, needles, you know, and so it has a little bit more of a presence and it's got a little um, sort of a, a, a kooky a shape to it. Um, but it's this one stays dwarf. Um, so so in summer, this one's just a plain old boring green Hugo pine, which I think is great. It's a great texture to, to play off of and you can you can work with. Um, but in winter, as a cold winter s- sets in, as a cold weather sits in, um, it, it turns yellow, like a nice yellow and then into an orange. And it's not a sickly color it's like it's like a full-on yellow orange and it looks really cool um but it's in it because it's a small plant it's in a small dose it's not like a giant um dose of um of yellow in the uh, in the snow which would not be good <laughs> um but you know i just i absolutely have to have it um deer i kind of doubt it um yeah. But you, you never know. Um, it's like I said, two to three feet tall, full sun. It wants full sun. Um, it can take super cold. Um, it's just it seems like the the type of plant and maybe it's because it's, you know, it's late in the season. I'm looking out the window and realizing I don't have a lot to look at. Um, but mm. this is this is one that, that keeps uh, popping up. Um, but but I, have to, I have to plant it with another evergreen though, because I worry that like wherever I'm going to plant it, everything else is going to die back and I'm going to have this yellow but doing her sitting, sitting, sitting out, you know, it's just like this yellow thing just sitting out there all by itself uh, looking weird. So I got to plant, I think I have to plant another evergreen with it. Um, but this is, this is one of the plants where I don't, uh, the, the name is Karsten's winter gold, or you can find it just as Karsten's C-A-R-S-T-N apostrophe mm-hmm. S. There is another plant called winter gold, winter gold mugo pine, which I think is taller. I'm oh, not, not the sure. same. It is not the same. It's not the same plant. So Karsten's winter gold or Karsten is the plant I'm talking about. Winter gold appears to be something completely different, which, and I oh. think it get, I think it gets taller and supposedly has like light green needles in springtime, you know, and holds on oh. to those. Um, okay. I'm not, exa- I'm not a hundred percent sure um, about all of that, but Karsten's winter gold, if they Google that and you find that plant, um, you're going to be good. Um mm-hmm. But, I, you know, I need more dwarf uh, evergreens. We all do. 
Yeah, I I definitely do. I mean, like you said, we're you know we're past the killing frost now. I'm looking outside and going, wow. You know, even having a primarily woody beast landscape. There's not a whole lot going on out there. I do not have enough evergreens. Um, hey, so two questions. One, did we see this Karsten's Winter Gold in one of the display gardens at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show last year? Yes, yes. And that's <laughs> where that's where the photo that's going to go up on the website is from. Oh, no um, way. Because, okay. because I, was, I was zipping through my the photos on my phone. And I was looking for for a different for a photo of one of the other plants. And I'm like, what is that? Oh, and then the sign right next to it says Karsten's Winter Gold. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. it. So that's that's the plan I put in the folder. That's the plan I'll go up on the on the website. Um, you can see it. It's it's um it's a love. Although it's indoors, you know. Um, well, yeah, it was in a display yeah. garden, but it was still pretty stunning because it, the- it, it has that yellow orange thing going mm-hmm. on to it. It's, it's it it was it stopped me enough that I took a picture of it. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember us both kind of gawking at it. I, I I didn't put two and two together when I saw your plant list today. Yeah, that was a cool. That was a very cool plant, and it was it was done very very well in that display garden too because it was it was offset with some dark green. I can't remember. Maybe there was it was Lakothawi was around it. So there was some dark green backdrop to it that was really really nice. Um, and yeah, it's surrounded by some hellebores. And he- I, and hellebores. Yeah. So I, I I was thinking like, oh, you went and looked at the photo, said, oh, I know where that's from, and then you're like, oh, I think I remember that. Being no, no, I really hellebores. did. I really didn't. I thought it was Lakothawi, but I remember it being surrounded by dark green and thinking, yeah, yeah, that looks really cool. Yeah, it, right? it really looks good. Yeah. So my second question is now: this is for both of us because we both recommended pines years and years and years ago. I splurged and I got a dragon's eye pine, which is Pinus, Draconis, you know, some other Harry Potter name, but a dragon's eye pine. I was super stoked about it. It was a pricey, pricey shrub tree. And I got pine borer and it was, it took, it took the plant out. I did everything in my, you know, I tried to prune out the areas where I could see. Is that, you know, is is that all pines? Are all pines going to be susceptible to that? Because that has been something I've been thinking about. Maybe I shouldn't pull the trigger. Well, if it's called pine borer, then I'm sure it affects all pines. But, yeah. you know, pine trees are, are native to where we live and pretty much all of mm-hmm. North America. So um, and then borers tend to go after plants that are under stress. Yes. So you had a newly planted okay. tree that was struggling to establish itself. It probably, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, fell victim to that. Uh, I'm I grow some dwarf um, uh, eastern white pine. I lost one of them to an attack of bagworms. Like they both got attacked by bagworms. Uh-huh. One of them died. One of them lived. Um, and then I have I have mini twists, which I talk about all the time. Which is another my eastern white pine. I've never had trouble with them. Um, okay, but all you know, right, but I think yeah, borers probably more so on a tree with with more bark to them. So I'm growing dwarf ones that don't have that. Um, have have that big trunk for them to to get into, so that yeah. might be a thing. And then, like I said, borers tend to go after trees in distress that are under stress anyway. All right, so I got to so, be better so take, about my water. Take, 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 take care of your darn plants, Danielle. You know, <laughs> I mean, seriously, especially when you're going to invest money in them. Criminy. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to get hate mail on this one, but I need you to All back right. me up. No way. <laughs> I need you to back me up. I picked a butterfly bush. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, I saw that on your list. All right. Okay. So here's the thing. I really... Is it, is it sterile? Before we even start out, is it sterile? Okay. It is not sterile. Okay. It is not sterile. <clears throat> so so, so it's, is... it's Danielle Sherry, uh, 23 <laughs> Maple Avenue. <laughs> so it's not sterile. However, there has been... It is not uh, a Davidii. It's not Budley a Davidii. Okay. It, it is straight according to recently our tech editor, Steve Aiken, in uh, a recent issue of Fine Gardening, did not include Davidii in the botanic name. And from the research that I've done, it's it, this is a new series, the Cascade series of butterfly bushes. And any place that I see it, it is not the official places that I've seen. It is not a Davidii. So it's Budlia Grand Cascade. And from all reports, no seeding that anyone has seen, but is not sterile. 
So it's a newer plant. I don't know where to fall on the on the spectrum here, but all I can say is if you're in an area, you know, where you've got full sun, rocky, sandy soil, where, you know, Budlia tends to seed itself like silly, this is not the plant for you. However, here in New England, in my garden, not so much an issue, hopefully, um, and deadhead, because this plant, I don't want to like it, but man, is it cool looking. So this Grand Cascade butterfly bush has a weeping habit and these panicle flowers that look like purple feather dusters, just huge, exploding out of the shrub. And each one of those flowers, those panicle flowers, are 14 inches long by four inches wide. They're huge, absolutely huge. Um, If you Google it and you go online, you see some pictures of these little kids. It must be the breeders, you know, granddaughter or daughter posing with this. It's really, really ginormous. Absolutely cool. But the shrub itself is not huge. It only gets to be five feet foot tall and about six feet wide, seven feet wide. So it's kind of this shorter, stumpier, weeping willowy looking budlia. Um, full sun, well-drained soil. Um, first, a couple of years ago, I stumbled upon this when this plant was a new release. It was 2008. 17, I believe, when they were, you know, kind of saying, hey, this is on the horizon. Then in 2018, Stephanie Cohen, perennial diva Stephanie Cohen, contributor to Fine Gardening, just sent me an email and was like, hey, did you see this? This thing looks really cool. No follow up. And then recently, which will be out in our issue 197, Fine Gardening Jan Feb, Irvin Etienne um, from Indianapolis suggested it and said that it was a dynamic plant. So that was enough for me. I'm like, you know, all signs point towards, I'm going to give this a whirl. I'm going to give it a try and um, freaking spectacular. I've, I've never seen anything like it. And there's not many plants that you often see. It doesn't even look like a Budlia. So zones five to 10, I think I got to try it. I'm, I'm just going to give it a whirl. What, what color are the flowers? They're a light, light lavender color. Um, it also comes in this Cascade series because they've since um, done a couple of other releases with this series. Uh, there's a pink and then there's one that they say is a darker purple, but not that it doesn't look that dark purple. It's not like Black Knight. It's just maybe amethyst instead of light lavender. But the Grand Cascade is light lavender. Um, super cool. I am kind of obsessed yeah i'm leery i'm leery of all budlias just from the the reseeding thing you know although i have seen i saw the picture of this one and it, it looks super cool and if it if it's if it doesn't recede cool uh mm-hmm. I, I would consider it um and it has a cool hat a lot of the new ones that are sterile like a lot of the dwarf ones they i yeah. always say this it looks like somebody sat on them yeah, the, Pugster. Pugster is one that's so they cute. All just, they all just kind of go straight out and like there's nothing yeah. on top. It looks like somebody sat on them. Uh, but this, this <laughs> looks like this looks like a great, um, you know, a great plant as long as it doesn't recede. And if yeah. if if you do live in an area um, where it does recede or you are concerned about that, just don't don't grow it. You don't have to okay. uh, you just don't you know, you don't have to get mad or anything. Just don't grow it and don't recommend yeah. it to people. Uh, yeah. But there are there are places in in this world where this would be a, a Perfect, perfect shrub. Um, And one of them might be Danielle's garden. It might be. And I'll report back because I am going to get this one. uh, Report back. um, And hopefully I find the same thing that um, all reports are also coming back as no seeding. But I'm going to give it a whirl. I'm going to give it a try. But I got to say, I I ripped out uh, Budlia maybe like three, four years ago. I'm still picking out seedlings. Oh, where it was. There's so many that do just, you know, reseed obnoxiously. Um, I grow Miss Molly, which I think I've talked about before on the, uh, on the podcast. And that's a sterile, a sterile version. And uh, I love it. It's absolutely beautiful. But um, yeah, I've got high hopes for this guy. So fingers crossed. 
Danielle, I'm going to utter a sentence I don't think anyone has ever said before. I'm going to grow a big leaf hydrangea for its for its foliage. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think Wait, I've mentioned, I, think, I think I've mentioned this one uh, on the uh, on the show the show the podcast before. Uh, new wave big leaf hydrangea. So it's hydrangea macrophylla new wave. Um, so it's it's a big leaf hydrangea. I believe it has uh, lace cap flowers. Again, I haven't grown this one. I've I've seen it um, and taken pictures of it, and and it has sparked um, fondness uh, in my soul. Uh, so the, the 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 flowers, you know, they're the serrated edges, but they're they're green and they're modeled. They have splashes and modeling and stippling of both gold and white around the edges, and it's just it's absolutely fascinating. It's a really cool thing. It's like um, somebody was painting, you know, a sign for the Green Bay Packers, you know, and the paint all fell onto the hydrangea. You know, it's the same color um, color vibe, you know, and and it's just it's just all over the place, uh, and it just it looks really cool. And so the problem I have with macrophyllas is they don't flower. And if this one doesn't flower, I don't care because, so cool. because the foliage looks, looks uh, amazing. Um, you know, partial shade, you know, to maybe full sun, depending on, on where you live. They say about five feet high and wide. And supposedly hmm. this is a sport of lemon wave, which oh. in my research looks exactly the same. I can't tell the difference between the two. <laughs> Um, so again, like, I don't know, like maybe this is a new wave, maybe it's a lemon wave. Um, but they both look super cool. Supposedly, again, because I haven't grown it, the, the, the variegation holds because the problem with a lot of variegated hydrangeas is that the variegation doesn't hold and they revert. Um, uh, mm. but supposedly this one isn't, isn't, isn't that way. And, um, every time I see this, I just, it, it makes my, it makes my heart beat faster. Um, New wave big leaf hydrangea. What's the well, look good luck to you? <laughs> well, good luck to you, sir. <laughs> good luck to you. All right. I was with you the whole time until you said it's a sport of lemon wave. Because I have a tragic story about lemon wave. I, like you, gave up on big leaf hydrangeas many, many years ago because of the same reasons. I'm not going to get flowers reliably, so whatever. So I started experimenting with variegated hydrangea and I got lemon wave and it was a big plant. I'm talking a three gallon ish type shrub, planted it. Great. Watered it. Great. Did well. First year. Great. Next year. Dead to the ground. Half the size. Following year. Third year. Dead to the ground. Quarter of the size. Fourth year. Goodbye, lemon wave. <laughs> it that, was that doesn't posted. sound that doesn't sound like the plant. That sounds like the gardener. Like no. because <laughs> plants don't do that. Like what would make a plant do that? It's it's in the wrong spot. It didn't get established. You know, like what whatever. Like there's that's not a that's not a plant. Like there there is no think... plant that that grows and gets smaller every year unless it's in the wrong spot. I beg to differ, sir. I think it just it really it it didn't have the winter hardiness that it needed to have um, in in my garden. Um, And I've heard similar things from other uh, folk in the hydrangea breeding business who said the same thing that it's, it's a winter hardiness thing that these, these it's, they're just not the toughest of plants, but however, did you you mulch its roots? Did I plant it in the pot, in the plastic pot? <laughs> Did I leave it in the pot? <laughs> that happens. That happens. But but also, now, this, this is a sport of lemon wave. Well, that's that's why I have hope for you, and I'm going to let you experiment around with it and report back because, you know, it, it, I really, really wanted – lemon wave in my garden. I really did. And uh, so if this is a sport and it could potentially be, you know, a little bit tougher and, and um, you, you, yeah. you, you've really harshed my buzz on this plant. Like I, was, so- I, I was excited and now <laughs> I'm I, sorry, I, I, bro. I, it's, it's, oh man. <laughs> I'm you sorry, but that does no. I have high hopes for you. I have I have high hopes that it's going to be you know that it is a sport that it's going to be new wave is going to be far tougher and that you can layer it for me so I can get some some babies off of it. I don't know. I just got the vibe. It's like it's like you know, 
when my dad thinks I'm, I'm about to do something that's a bad idea, it's like, oh, I guess you can do that. I wouldn't do that. But no, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Knock you yourself know. out. Knock yourself out. No, no, no. I, I, I have high hopes. I really do. I definitely have high hopes. Um, okay. Well, here, I, I'll throw out my weirdo plant so you can harsh on my plant. Are you ready? Tip for mm-hmm. tat. Okay. So you remember when we went to Plant Delights Nursery a couple years ago and we recorded a podcast there? How could I forget? Okay. You remember when we went down the little scree garden and there was lined up probably, what, 30 different mangaves? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I swear, Steve, like, our, time, our, our time together is not as special to you, clearly, as it is to me. Well, I just don't remember things the way you do. So, like, with the Purple <laughs> Cones story, I, uh, in my memory, I was driving. No. And, and, and you and you were, you were clapping with your hands. You're doing your little clap thing with your hands. <laughs> oh no, I was doing the clap thing, but I was driving, which is why you almost had a heart attack. <laughs> so so, so, so the, the, the trauma I experienced probably, you know, affected. No, me. no, no, no. Yeah, that must be it. That must Go be on. it. So, so if you hadn't suffered a TBI in that, you know, experience, you would remember that we we were at Plant Delights Nursery, and there were all these mangaves, and they were outside. They were potted. And you would actually turn to me and, and were like, hey, what do you think of these? And I, I poo-pooed them. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I, I think they're kind of weird. They got these long yucca-like, agave-like leaves, kind of weird spots and whatnot. And you, you said, but you have an agave collection. What the heck? And, I, and I, I thought about it and thought, yeah, well, they aren't that different from agaves, sands the spikes. But I got enough going on with my agave collection, having to bring that in and out every winter. So I've I've stayed away from this mangave trend. Everywhere you look, there's mangaves. Every flower show you go to, there's mangaves. So it's a cross between an agave and a manfreda. But there's a new one coming out that's called Praying Hands. And it looks like a giant artichoke. <laughs> It's it's this giant dark green artichoke. It's that shape with the tight, you know, upward facing curved leaves, all layered kind of in this spiral fashion. And the edge of each one of those leaves is a dark purpley burgundy color. And then there's a big old purple spike on the end of each leaf. This thing is so weird. It's so cool. I feel like I'm I'm ready. I'm down. I want this mangave praying hands. I think it'll look really good with the rest of my agaves. It's zone nine to to 11. So I is not going to be any time, any kind of hardy for me, but I'll put it in a pot. I'll put it with the rest of my agaves. It's super cool. It's so weird. I just want a giant artichoke plant. It just looks cool. If, if, if you gave an artist, an artichoke and said, make a sculpture out of this. That's what that plant looks like because it's basically an artistic representation of an artichoke. It very it's, much looks like, like an artichoke would like to look, you know, like, <laughs> it's like a sculpture of an artichoke. Have you ever seen like a sculpture of like a fern frond? And you're like, yeah. wow, that's gorgeous. I never knew fern fronds could look like that. They really don't like in, you know, but they've, they've given it like the artistic, you know, vibe to it. And that's what this, that plant looks like. It, it's super cool looking. It's amazing it's so looking. Cool. And uh, I have I have one uh, mangave. I, you know, I haven't you been, do? yeah, um, I haven't been that impressed with them because they just look like, um, like agaves with spots, like weird spots or like there's, you know, some of them are really, it's like with a lot of things, there's most of them are unimpressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some there are the one I have, I love, I don't know what, what name it is, but it's, it, it did great for me this summer. Uh, so like if you could add, if, if you could add cool colors and spots to an agave, this is what you would, would get with this, this mangave and softer, softer leaves. Is the, 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 at least on mine, yeah. it's less here and not as pokey. Like every time I yeah. move around one of my agaves and it stabs me, I'm like, why do I grow these things? <laughs> you know, they're always poking me. But, but, you know, I don't have that problem with, with my um, mangave. And that seems like a really cool one. And, and yeah. I want, I want one too. It, you know what it, you do? You know, you know what it looks like? It kind of looks like um, Audrey from, or what's the name <gasps> of the from Little Shop of Horrors? Little, Little Shop of Horrors. Little Shop yeah. of Horrors. Yes. 
Audrey and Audrey too. Yes, the the man eating plant. It kind of looks like that because it has. It, it looks like, it like, like a like a bud waiting to open. Yes. So, so, yes. so if you if you do grow this, just be careful. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm going to. So, All right, Steve. We're yeah. down to the final final plan. The final one with that has another three different names. Um, are you are you familiar with Vi- Viburnum lantana? Yes. Do you know that? Okay. Um, do you know yes. it's 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 uh, it's common name? Uh, Linden. Viburnum? No. No. It's, and I didn't I didn't know this till I was just because I always called it Viburnum lantana. Um, it's called wayfaring tree. No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's called wayfaring tree, <laughs> and it's used. It's used so, um, so so regularly that I had to include it. So I would say, my next plant, ladies and gentlemen, is variegated wayfaring tree. That... <laughs> Why is it called wayfaring tree? Funny you should ask. The wayfaring tree got its name from the herbalist, herbalist, herbalist Gerard. Because back is, in the day, should I know Gerard? He was the share of his day. Apparently, only had one name. He's the herbalist Gerard. Okay. All right. um, okay. I'm the herbalist Gerard. <laughs> Gerard is here. Um, in 1597, okay. in 1597, he noticed it on the routes between Wiltshire and London. And it is said, if you see a wayfaring tree, you are on or near a path. Don't you wish there was a better story for that? <laughs> so excited i thought that you know it grew on the side of the ocean and wayfarers who passed by knew well, it, that that was the channel that they had to navigate up to get a pot of gold i don't yeah, know or, 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 or gerard met his love you know going down this this path all the time you know yeah. and like that that was like their um that's how they knew they were on the right path but anyway um uh, yeah. that's that's Lame. a story <laughs> well as is as is you know the name wayfaring tree um, so let's just call it Vi- Viburnum uh, lantana. So okay. what, what's the cult of our name? Um, Varigatum, Varigata, or Wavecrest? Wavecrest? Appar- apparently all three of these things are the same plant. I have no idea. Huh. Okay. But whatever, Steve, who cares what it's called? What are you talking about and why are you talking about it? It's a Viburnum and the green leaf is just, it's just splashed with gold and cream and white, kind of like um, new wave uh, hydrangea, hydrangea. But, but not so much. It just looks like a little spatter, you know, and maybe like a little splotch here. Um, so somebody was spray painting, you know, Green Bay Packer colors, you know, in the area and some of the spray I got on this plant. Um, and it's just, it's really cool. I saw it in Portland two years ago, whenever, the, back whenever I used to travel, uh, who can remember? Um, and it was just, it was just right in my face because it was on, I was on a sidewalk and there's like a two to three foot, um, tall wall and it was planted on top of that wall. So it was like right in my face. And so it's a very subtle thing. Like you can't, you kind of notice it from, uh, from far away. There's something different about that show, but you don't know. But as you get up closer and closer, you, you, you decide, wow, that's really cool. Um, so it was that, what was that term from, from clueless, uh, like a Monet, they look oh, good from, yeah. the distance. They get good from they, a distance. This this is kind They're of the opposite. This is, this is kind of the opposite. The closer you get to it, the better it looks. You know, invites mm-hmm. close inspection, um, and it's and it's really great. So you know, uh, viburnums have have white flowers. You know, in spring, so you get that. Um, they turn into like red berries that turn black or something like that. But it's just it's this multicolored splashed uh, foliage um, that really make me want wayfaring tree. That is so cool. Yeah. I, but, I don't let me, know. Let me, let me say zones, zones, zones four to eight. Oh, um, okay. Some will say seven, zone seven. But I saw this in Portland, Oregon, which is which is a pretty solid zone eight. Um, okay. Six to eight feet tall, full sun to partial shade. Not picky about soil, apparently. Um, but uh, variegated wayfaring tree. If you look up Viburnum lantana variegatum, variegata, or wave crest, you find pictures of plants that all look pretty much the same. So if you get any one of those, you're going to get this cool thing with this, 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 um, just a, just real gentle thing. I love it when, when you get closer to something and then it looks really cool. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's a surprise plant. So wait, flowers, berries, uh, white flowers. Okay. Yeah. You know, tip, typical of, uh, of viburnum. The, the berries oh. are red that turn to like black or dark purple or whatever 
color they turn well to. that would be cool too you get that variegated foliage and then you get yeah. red berries that's yeah. awesome okay there, there there are some reports and all i ever see are reports and, and people commenting that this is that it has uh, escaped cultivation in the midwest uh, um, but it is i could not find it on any state's invasive species list uh, okay. so again again if, if that's if that's a concern to you, um, do do not grow this this plant. Uh, this but if you don't live you. in the Midwest or, or you know you know worried about that, uh, this might be worth looking into. Or you can just deadhead the entire shrub all the time. <laughs> I think that me- might need to go on my list too. That sounds really cool. That's my pick of your four. I, I like just that I just one. I just want I just want I just want to know more about the the herbalist Gerard. <laughs> Maybe we can have him on expert testimony. <laughs> he, he was most oh, certainly a fop. He was a foppish man, you know. Foppish. Yeah. Oh, that's the that's the vocab word of the day. Where's Peter when you need him? Um, all right. I feel like I feel like we just we should just end the episode on that one because my right. my cool. last one <laughs> my last plant isn't that ex- and this has wait, been, as exciting. Let's, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. I love Hacnacloa aureola. I don't have a lot of partial shade, shade situations. I try to get it into full sun constantly. It burns. It resents me. It spites me. It dies. So I've given up on that. Last year, I was in Colorado. I saw this golden foxtail grass, which is allopecoris. Pray tens, arrow variegatus. There we go. That was a mouthful, but I think wait, I did it right. Wait. What? Allo pecoris. Oh, allo Nope. No. It's no. It's a l o p e c u r u s. Oh. Allo pecoris. Allo pecoris. Oh. Yeah. Pray cool. tens. Aereo variegatus. So it's golden foxtail grass. This is zones three to nine. And it is basically Hacnacloa areola for full sun. It'll it'll take a little bit of light shade. You you totally underplayed that. And then you come back in with, oh, yeah, I don't don't have anybody to bring to the party. It's just (laughs) Michelle Obama. Come on in, Michelle. Yeah, I know. I mean, yeah. I I don't think it's as cool as your last shrub, the our lovely wayfarer tree. But um, no, so no, this no. Is, you're, I just did a great job, you know, explaining it. When you see it, it's going to be unimpressive. But you're like hacking a cloa for full sun. Yeah, I mean, right. I totally want that. So so okay. So picture it: twelve to sixteen inches tall, twenty four inches wide. It's more cold hardy than um, Hacnocloa is as well. It's more subs. It's more sun tolerant, which we went over. It does need consistent moisture for getting established, but then it will do well um, and has some drought tolerance once established. Um, just needs a well drained soil. It's got green ish blades that light green that have gold and kind of a little bit of white striping to it so it looks basically the same very similar i will say not the same as hacknocloa areola um i already said zones three to nine so that's pretty cool and then it does this weird thing that hacknocloa doesn't do now you know hacknocloa gets the you know kind of that almost uh I don't know what it's like wheat, like, you know, flower to it. It's a little arching. It gets a little kind of dancing, um, little, I don't know. Help me out, Steve. What is it? It's, it's, I, it's I, a I don't plume. Know, but, but it's not, yeah. Don't spend your time saying what it is not. Tell us what it it's is. It's a plume. So, okay. So, so this, this golden foxtail grass does more of what you would expect from, um, Molinia sky racer. So you've got the tough of cool foliage below. And then in early summer, it shoots up these little firecrackers and has a little golden fluffy tuffet at the top, uh, as it's, as it's flower. So you kind of get this see-through plant. 
um, kind of look to it. So it's like two grasses that we know so well, but full sun and really, really cool. So this I need in my life. Like I said, I saw it at the Denver Botanic Gardens last year, a year before, I can't remember. Loved it, took a picture of it, and then started doing some more research on it and thought, whoa, why the heck am I not growing this golden foxtail grass? Well, why isn't anybody growing this? I mean, it sounds I fascinating. <laughs> Has a huge range of hardiness. Is I want, I'm wondering if that's a Western so in free I, Portland, like it can't take winter moisture because with what you're describing, like that plant should be everywhere around here. You know, it yeah, sounds I, really, really cool. I don't know. I, you know, I found me- several sources for it online. Um, I found a lot of information for it on uh, Blue Stem from Blue Stem Nursery. Um, it was. Isn't that, isn't that in Cal- uh, Canada? Canada. Canada. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, so I but found, where in Canada? Like Western Canada? Uh, I don't know. Hold on. I can Google it. <laughs> I'm not sure. So I got I got a lot of information about it from there, but it's I, I, maybe that's it. Maybe it's the winter moisture thing, but I have a really well drained soil and I'm, I, I, I don't generally have an issue with that. So I don't know. I love it. I love it, but it might not love me, but I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you 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 have to grow this and report back. Yes, I will. You know? I will. But but if you if you want like a golden striped grass, why not try El Dorado uh, Calamagrostis? You know, I which do. is a little taller. So it's, it's a different habit than um, than hacking a clove. But it's you get your green and and yellow grass going but on. That, but that's just it. It's a little bit taller, and it's not yeah. you know it's not gonna it doesn't have the same habit of that kind of tufted mass you know and that that flowy movement in the the one foot range that's really what i want you know i really want that look um and forever i've been trying to force it you know force hackneycloa into my full sun air and it's it's non-compliant the the darn thing is non-compliant so i'm gonna i'm gonna give golden foxtail grass a try instead yeah, that's that that you ended with a winner. I don't know why you you, you downplayed it. You you did that you did that that thing like oh no one's really gonna and then you know oh, the exact opposite is the worst where someone you're gonna love this. Yeah, this movie is so great and you go into it and like yeah it was a good movie but it wasn't that great. You did the opposite and said so, oh, it's I- not gonna be that great and then it, it, it came out great. Oh, all right, I get the Jingle Bell Award. Sure. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter with a fantastic, frabulalidocious wish. If you've ever seen a dog or a cat scout out the perfect place to lie down, circling to be sure before plunking down in the sunny spot, the warm floor in front of the fireplace, or the side of the bed that you thought was yours, then you'll have a sense of what my garden wish is. Yes, my friends, I wish for a plant that will plant itself. Here's how I imagine it. I bring the plant home, set it on the ground and say, go ahead, now find your home. Strong white roots emerge from the drainage holes in the pot, lift the plant up and start moving about the garden. It pauses at a few potential spots before finally snuggling into a spot where it feels like it could thrive. Oh, and the neighbouring plants will either rustle with approval or wilt in dissent. The creatures of the forest will emerge to inspect and chitter with support for the new addition. Then two yellow birds will swoop in carrying in their beaks a cape of the finest silk to drape around my shoulders as I... Oh, I've done it again, haven't I? I've gone full Disney. I'm so sorry. I promised never to do this again. Perhaps all I should wish for is a pup from one of Danielle's variegated agaves. And if she could deliver it by descending slowly into my garden via her magical umbrella, oh, that would be a jolly holiday indeed. Chim chim churi, everyone. Danielle, I didn't know you were Peter's fairy godmother. You don't know everything about me, Steve. What else I don't know is what our expert on expert testimony has to say. Hey, podcast listeners. This is Joseph Tykonovich. I'm a pretty regular uh, fine gardening contributor, and I draw the little cartoons that you may have seen on Fine Gardening's Facebook and Instagram pages. And I've written a couple books. I've got a new book coming out in February called A Comic Book Guide to Growing Food. Um, So today I'm going to talk about some plants that I have on my wish list for my next gardening year of gardening in 2021. 
And I'm always inspired to get, put plants on my wish list, usually when, by visiting botanic gardens. I love going to the local botanic gardens and seeing plants there. And that's where a lot of my wish list plants come from that I'm going to talk about today. So the first one I want to talk about is a plant I saw at Norfolk Botanic Garden, which is uh, kind of near me here in Virginia. And I was there in the end of September, which is kind of a slow time in the garden, and found this huge patch of Zephyranthes candida, which is one of the rain lilies. So it's a little low-growing amaryllis relative. This has white flowers, but I was just stunned because it was this carpet of it growing in shade under a small tree, just completely covered with white flowers. It was such a fresh explosion of bloom at the sort of tired end of the gardening season. So it's definitely, definitely on my list. I think it's uh, one of the rain lilies I'd overlooked because it kind of looks like plain white flowers, but seeing it growing in mass like that, it was really, really stunning. So Zephyranthes are about zone 7 hardy, the rain lilies, and they're called rain lilies because they tend to bloom repeatedly through the summer after each rainfall. And if you're in colder places than zone 7, like when I lived in Michigan in zone 5, I and a lot of people overwintered them pretty successfully in containers. You grow them in a big container, you enjoy them through the summer, and then come in winter, just put them in somewhere like an unheated garage or somewhere like that where they'll stay cool and dormant, but you know, sheltered from the most extreme uh, winter cold. Uh, the next plant that I want to talk about is something called a wing bean. This is the, the Latin name is Sophocarpus tetragonolobus, which is a really great name. Um, this is actually an edible plant, but again, I saw it at Norfolk Botanic Gardens and was blown away because it produces, uh, you know, an edible pod like a green bean, but the pods are very hard to describe. They have like these four ruffled like frills running down each of the pods and really pretty quite large lavender flowers so they were growing it as an ornamental and i was like this is the coolest little bean pea type of thing that i've ever seen and then googling around apparently it's quite delicious you can eat the pods it produces edible tubers apparently supposed to be good Um, so i always love something that can do edible and ornamental at the same time So I'm really excited to try it in my vegetable garden next year um, and see if it tastes as good as it looks. And even if it doesn't, totally delicious, I think I'll enjoy growing it anyway because it is really, really quite beautiful. The third plant on my wish list is an iris. Um, This is an iris variety called Aichi no Kagayaki. So this is one of the Sudata hybrids. So it's a hybrid between... Iris pseudoecorus, which is the yellow flag iris, which is that incredibly invasive, overly vigorous, weedy uh, water iris. So it's a hybrid between that and one of the Japanese irises, Iris Inceta. So Iris Inceta is fussy and incredibly beautiful, and the hybrid between that and this weedy uh, yellow uh, flag iris produces a sterile hybrid that you don't have to worry about being invasive that is incredibly vigorous and really, really beautiful. So I've always loved the Sudata hybrids, um, but this one is really stunning because when the leaves come out in the spring, they are like screaming yellow. They're brilliant. Really, really, really showy. I I was walking again at Norfolk Botanic Gardens, saw this in the spring from across the garden and was just blown away by the intensity of that yellow, yellow color of the new foliage. And then it also, you know, has pretty flowers later in the season, but just for an early burst of spring color, I was really, really excited. Both of the parents are water irises, and so they can grow in standing water, but the hybrids are really adaptable, and, and I found them grow very easily in my just standard garden soil as well. And my last one is something that's not very unusual or very weird, but I kind of was excited to see this. This was, again, I was visiting another botanic garden, uh, Lewis Ginter Botanic Garden in Richmond, Virginia, another one of my favorite botanic gardens here in the area. And it's garlic chives, which if you know it, it's a little uh, allium tuberosum. It's a little allium that is grown as an edible because it kind of has this garlicky, oniony flavor to the foliage. Um, but I was there in the end of August, which is a very sad time for Virginia Gardens. It's, everything's hot and tired, and it was blooming its head off with big masses of, of white flowers. Uh, it's a very adaptable plant, very hardy, zone 5, at least sun or shade. Uh, it can be, apparently, a little bit aggressive, a little bit weedy, but I have a new garden with a lot of space, and I definitely would love to have that running around and blooming through, this, through you know, that late summer period when nothing is looking good. You know, the thing that gets me about Joseph is every time he's on this podcast, every time he writes an article for us, he highlights some of the coolest stinking plants. He does breeding. He gets the rarest of the rare. I mean, I, I, I just, I would pay a large amount of money just to peek over the garden fence to see what he's got going on in his garden. Yeah. And then you'll pay a large amount of money to get yourself out of jail for doing that. (laughs) That would not be a very merry holiday.
Hello, listeners. Steve here. Do you know what I love more than a plant that will actually survive my neglect? It's a discount. And I'm not talking about any 5 or 10% markdown. I need at least 20% to turn my head. That's why I'm thrilled to tell you that you, our listeners, can get 30% discount on anything and everything at the Taunton Press store. And that includes the new Best of Fine Gardening archive. Yes, go to T-A-U-N-T-O-N-S-T-O-R-E dot com, enter the promo code podcast and get 30% off now. Sent off now. Sent off now.